Are we live? Yeah, oh, there's the button. It said live. Hello, gang. <laughs> it's Andy from Cocktail Hour. Welcome. And with us, he, uh, the show, is Sherry the Rest. Say hello, Sherry. Hello. Good evening. Yeah. Welcome to the show. Yep, and our intrepid author guest, who you know, this, she's a virgin on this on the show, so <laughs> we're gonna try and treat her delicately. It's Mary Shannon. Woo! Hello. Come on. Get up in there. I'm jumping in. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome. We're really happy to have you here. Thank you. This is really fun. I'm excited. So far, so good. <laughs> well, I know that this is what our hundred and one show, hundred and one show, right? It is our hundred and first. You yes. would say yes, first, the one hundred and one. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, we're we're happy. Welcome we're to back. Cocktail Hour one hundred and one. We'll, we'll be passing out the syllabus later. Absolutely. Oh, that's for Sandra Moran, isn't it? Yeah. Well, you know, Cocktail Hour one hundred and one. You know, I'm with you. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And, speaking of Cocktail Hours and one hundred and one. Um, uh, Holy shit, Andy! <laughs> oh my god! What's the, I had? Um, I had some V8 juice, quite frankly, and I threw in two jiggers of vodka. So besides the uh, liver being pickled, the taste buds are pretty happy. That's awesome. <laughs> what did you make, Jared? I um, I poured in um, some vodka up to about here, with the ice was already in there. So what I do is I just pour it and I count to five. That, that seems so to be to me. Yeah, that, that's about it. It's about a double shot, and then I have um, some spicy clamato, nice. and um, a pickled Brussels sprout, and some olives. Wait, 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 wait! Stop! Stop! <laughs> you have what in there? See, when my grandfather would make, uh, I think it might be a Wisconsin thing. I don't know, but when my grandfather would make Bloody Marys, he would have pickled Brussels sprouts, and. Um, they're they're really very good, so I try to always have some on hand. I've never had a pickled Brussels sprout. I didn't even know they made such a thing. Yes, when you come uh, in August, I will make you a Bloody Mary um, or a Bloody Caesar. Oh, I'm having yeah, so I'm having Bloody Caesar, uh, or a um, what was a tr a tr uh, a Trachel Buck B Bronco? Do you remember the one that Shane Curry did? It was a Bloody oh, Mary with tequila. Yeah. yeah. It was very good. So yeah. either way, I'll make sure that I have some Brussels sprouts on hand, and I'll make you something. I like Brussels sprouts. That's a winner. All right, then. What are you having, Mary? Also a Bloody Mary. A what? Also a Bloody Mary. Mm -hmm. This one's made with my favorite mix that's called Zing Zang, and it's oh, spicy and good. That's really, really good. That's that's my second I'm favorite. I'm not as brave as you with the vodka. I only have, like... That much in there. Well, I didn't think. I thought you were going Virgin Mary. So uh, I was thinking Mary. about it, but it was my birthday yesterday, and so I want to have some alcohol. Awesome and belated happy birthday. Yeah. Thank you. Thank we you. We missed it. Well, belated. Yeah. Happy birthday. Wow. Are you, are you old enough to drink alcohol? I don't. I don't know. Can we see some ID? Right, exactly. Uh, well, it would be the um, 18th maybe anniversary of when I was old enough to drink alcohol. <laughs> so yeah. Get the hell out of here. Wow. Yeah. You, you got a baby face. Well, thank you. <laughs> wow. I'm I'm shocked. Whew. Okay. So, um we have a little housekeeping, Sherry? We do. Um so we've got uh, we've got a handful of viewers already. So, uh, if you have a question or a comment, uh, just click on the little Q&A button and you should be able to go ahead and type whatever you want and we will break in regularly to take care of any questions or comments uh, for Mary um, or for us if you want to say hi to us too because you know we like attention I'm just saying that's, what so, I would that's right we're just big attention whores so <clears throat> it's not often we'll admit that but Andy's already half drunk so you know, who knows what's going to happen. Maybe later she'll show us her pants. <laughs> oh, that was a low blow. <laughs> yeah, we're okay. coming, I'm coming to you pants-free tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all, don't picture it, honestly. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so last episode, you may remember it, it was episode 100, and we had Colette Moody on, and we kind of ripped apart a book that we actually really liked, but it still had stuff in it that was rippable. It was a lot of fun. Um, 
<laughs> and we had some some good comments. Uh, we were giving away uh, the winner's choice of either a cocktail hour mug or a pint glass from our Cafe Press store. And um, Adrian uh, is the winner. So, Adrian, thank you very much. And uh, you've never won anything, so congratulations. Congrats. Is that our Adrian, buddy Adrian? It is. It is, it is Texas Shiva herself. So, um, see, Adrian, you just got to come by and comment. We'll give you things. Oh, speaking of giving people things, I just want to thank... Um, uh, <laughs> Elaine for being insanely patient because um, I just want to say this is Elaine's cocktail hour mug. It's still um, here with me um, and then I also put together because you know I just never make it to the post office. I also um, threw in some some Ilva postcards because I still have Ilva postcards to give away to anybody who wants them. Um, some some various cocktail hour buttons because we have hundreds of cocktail hour buttons left. And um, I threw in a, a keychain also for, for Elaine, just for being so incredibly patient. I'm going to get to the post office next week. I, I'll shoot for Monday, I promise. <laughs> I promise. OK, so Adrian, it won't be a problem, because yours will be delivered right to you, and I'll have absolutely nothing to do with it. Let me know in two weeks if you don't hear anything, because that means I forgot to order it. <laughs> just saying. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. Uh, <laughs> that's all I got. Thanks. <laughs> one more thing. One more thing. Uh, Mary Shannon has graciously offered up. Sherry, helps out. Oh, <laughs> Mary, you yep. tell us what you're offering. What are you? What are you giving? Oh my God. So I have a paperback copy of Prayer of the Handmaiden to give away to somebody, and then I've also got an ebook version that we're gonna give away. Sweet. Nice. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. Yay. So thank you very much. It's very generous of you. Um, and just so everybody knows, whenever the authors give stuff away and they're sending stuff out, nine times out of ten, they're they're absorbing that cost themselves because we, we won't do that because, you know, <laughs> we don't have access to the stuff, right? So, you know, so well, be... Since it's coming from my stash, I'll even sign it for you oh, before I send it out. That, that's awesome. Seriously, that's, that's right. pretty awesome. Yeah. All right, so I'm done. Go ahead. Are you sure you're done now? I'm pretty sure. Do I, I have you. anything else? Is anybody out there? Can you say hello? Hello. All right. Hello. <laughs> okay. All right, so let's get down to biz because Mary Shane is like, I'm going to talk about my shit. Come on now. Right. So anyway, um, Mary, <laughs> Mary's like, what did I give myself? Um, uh, Mary came on the scene with... Uh, Sort of the Guardian a few years ago. How long has it been? Like 10 years. <laughs> oh my God. It's been I was very naughty and did not get my next book out for a long time. So it's been, it was 2001, I think. Wow. Oh my God. No, it couldn't yeah. have been. Really? Jinx. It was a long time ago. Wow. It's, it's 2015. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I blush in shame. The woman has a life. That's what it is. <laughs> Holy shit. She has a life. She's like, I don't have time to write. I got a life. All right. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. Uh, well, wait so a minute. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Because, okay, let's let's not make it so bad. Wait. When did, when did Branded Ann come out? Branded Ann was 2008. You know what? Now that I think about it, I think the initial publication date on Sword of the Guardian was actually 2006. And I had written it, I had started writing it in 2001-ish. So, yeah, 2006 was sort of The Guardian, 2008 was Branded Ann. Okay, and then so, 2015 see, is Prayer of the Handmaiden. So not quite as bad. Not quite as bad. That's still pretty bad. <laughs> it's well, still, yeah, it's, yeah. it's still yeah. painful. But. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, well, uh, let me clarify something for the audience. When I say she blasted onto the scene, I did not mean like that was her debut novel, because as Sherry mentioned, Mary wrote Branded Ann. But this is the first in the Legends of Etheria, Etheria, mm -hmm. am I saying that correctly? Mm -hmm. Saga, yeah. if you will. And it started out with one word, oh, was it <coughs> nine or ten years ago? <coughs> mm -hmm. um, and it was Thor the Guardian, um, which introduced us to, you know, a nice selection of characters, but the two main uh, of that book were Princess Shasta and Talon. And they make a, 
a bit of an appearance in this particular book, which is the one we're going to talk about today, and we're going to try and make it as spoiler-free as possible. You know us. <laughs> it's going to be a challenge. No, we're um, going to do it this time. Mary's here to really talk about is Prayer of the Handmaiden, which is her newest. Mm -hmm. um, and she introduces, uh, well, actually, I believe one one of the characters in this book that you focus on was in the, it was in. They both were. Guardian. Was the other, was the Kate character? Yes. It's been years since I read really good. Kate very much in the first book. Um, yeah, okay. She's mentioned quite a bit as sort of the Arinda's backstory in the first okay. book, and then we really get into their story in the second one. Okay, cool. So yeah, that's 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 it. That's the whole thrust of it is really their story. Even mm -hmm. though Shasta and Talon come in to the to this book, it's really about Arinda and Kate. Mm -hmm. Arinda. Yep. Arinda. Really sucks. I'm really excited. I got that right. Okay, so we are hoping that you would give us a, a brief summary of the book. You know, we're trying to keep it spoiler-free now. Don't spoil <laughs> okay, it. I'll do my best. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the second book basically talks about these two characters that fell in love as teenagers and were separated by circumstances of life. Um, Kadrian ends up going into the service of the goddess and becoming a priestess and sort of going her own direction. And Arinda spends the next seven years or so pining after this um, girl that she was in love with. And we actually get to see in sort of the Guardian some of that pining that was going on. And so the second book talks about how they're reunited and sort of the adventures that they have to go through and sort of the rediscovery that they have of the feelings that they never lost. And um, in the meantime, they have to fight a bad guy and save the world. So <laughs> it's um, it's kind of equal parts adventure and romance, I would say. So oh, that's a nice know, point. I, I think that the readers um, who who read Sword of the Guardian and waited and waited and waited pa very patiently <laughs> for Prayer of the Handmaiden, okay. um, they'll they'll really be able to relate to this. You know, the seven years of pining. I think. You know, <laughs> Yeah, we've been waiting seven years pining for a follow-up. That's exactly you know, how <laughs> that, seriously. It's all um, karma. You know what I mean? Anyway. Yep, so yep. so um, I just want to break in real quick. Cheryl uh, is is watching. Hi, Cheryl. Uh, sort of the, she says, Sort of the Guardian won a Goldie in 2006-ish, right? So, And then she waves, says, Hi, guys. Hi, Cheryl. All right. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, okay, so... Uh, do you want to start, Andy, or do you want me to start? I do. I really, and I'm really glad that you're on the hot seat. Mary. Oh, but before we go, we should tell everybody. I'm just, I'm, so, I'm just going to jump in for just a second. Oh, okay. go ahead. All right. So if you're interested in, in hearing the show that we did, because uh, we, Andy and I did do a show on Sword of the Guardian. It was one of, I think it was episode eight. I'm pulling that out of, out of my. Is that right? Episode eight. It was early in the show. I'd have to go back and yeah. look. Yeah, so start at 8 and then, or just go to the site and type in your So we filter our site by author name. So you yeah. can go to your, do the drop down, Mary Shannon, pop, it'll give you that show and this one, depending on when you go to search for it. That's right. Okay. There you go. There you go. That's um, what I'd say. <laughs> um, I really, really, really want to tell you, Mary, that you have your descriptives and how you can tell an adventure side of your story, like your battle scenes and your, I mean, just, oh, wow. It's like I almost, and I know I'm so bad. I mean, I don't skip to the end and read the end before I read it, but I almost want to skip through the narrative and the, and the stuff about the individuals just so I can get to your adventurous battle scenes because I'm like, <laughs> oh. I mean, they are so good. I mean, they're just fantastic. So Thank there you go. I'm you. a modern, modern fan there, so. I have a lot of fun writing them. The the battle scenes always sort of play out in my head like a like a scene from Lord of the Rings. So mm -hmm. I have it's a real challenge to write them because I want to be like everywhere at once on the battlefield narratively. Mm -hmm. And my editor will often pull me back because I'll be trying to write something that happened and then I'll go back in time like 15 minutes to tell something else that happened from a different character's point of view and she's like, you can't do that. <laughs> so, um, but they are a lot of fun to write and they um, they are sort of a relief from some of the, the emotional drama and the relationship stuff where you just get to talk about kicking ass. It's fun. Oh, man, I like it. You can, you can kick some ass, too. I mean, wow. Seriously? <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, and I think that we had that we had that same reaction because I, I feel the same way. And and you know the um, if if anybody listening or watching has not uh, has not read any of Mary's books yet, if you are a fan of a lot of angst and um, and and emotional trauma, uh, you know, relationship based, you definitely want to read this. But uh, you know, also, you do your world building and and your action, um, the the stuff with the goddesses and the the mythology and all of that kind of stuff is, is just incredible. And for for both Andy and I, because we've talked about this before, that is really what we look for um, in the books. You know, um, Cade and Arinda, there that's fine. You know, but. <laughs> Let's go kick that redheaded bitch's ass, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, there, there's there's one character who um who I hope that we see again in the future, and I think it, I'm I'm going I'm assuming that her name is pronounced Micah. Micah, yes. Yes, okay, which is also my son's name, so that's that's pretty good. Oh. It's spelled differently. <laughs> um, she was a little badass. And yeah. I, you know, I, I kind of sort of, I, I, I kind of thought that maybe she would be the next picked. And for those of you who haven't read the book yet, I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. Yeah. But I was kind of hoping, no, I'm not going to ruin anything. I was kind of hoping she would be the next in line. Um, yeah, but, but who knows what, if, if Mary decides to, to move that character in the forefront of the next book, I mean, who the hell knows? I mean, you know, Scott she, could, she could be like a freaking holy warrior, man, because oh, she right? was... Badass. I mean, she was. She's badass. fun. She has some growing up to do, I think. Yeah. Um, I actually do have future books planned for this series, and she's going to be in one of them. And so um, I wasn't really sure that that's what I was going to do with her when I first started writing her and sort of threw her into the story. But the um, the bigger her role became, and the more uh, defined and sort of living and breathing her character became, the more I was like, this girl needs her own story. So yeah. probably not the next book. Probably the book after that is going to be her story, and we'll get to find out more about her and how she's grown up and whether she's matured at all. <laughs> um, and she was just she was a ton of fun to write because she's so um, so chatterboxy and um, just so full of life and doesn't really care what other people think about her and just kind of takes her own path. And, um, yeah, she's so yeah, yeah. really fun to tell a story about. She. Um, you know, she she seemed to have some issues with um, authority. <laughs> you know, just a tad. Just well, a we kind of hint a little bit that she used to travel a lot around with her dad, and she doesn't really have a place that she considers home. So she's kind of been out on her own and independent for a long time, and um, it, I think that plays into this complete lack of caring she has about what anybody else thinks about what she's doing or what she's supposed to be doing. She just does what seems right to her at the time and in the moment. She's got a really big heart and um, gets herself into a lot of trouble that Cade then has to bail her out of. So. <laughs> Cade wasn't sure what to do with her. <laughs> you know, and Cade, Cade is, you know, she's... Um... She's super sensitive. I'm not going to lie. There are a few times I wanted to smack her around and just, you know, shake her a little bit and say, pull yourself together, focus on what's going on, and stop feeling sorry for yourself, and let's take care of some stuff, okay? Mm -hmm. um, Kick some evil ass. That's yeah. <clears throat> she, um, but, you know, one of the things that I, that I liked about, about it is that from from the background stuff that you wrote about her, it was very true. She stayed very true to uh, to who you had her planned out to be. From you know, as you describe her as a young person, very emotional, and there were several times, or at least a, a couple of times, where you wrote uh, coming from Arinda's point of view that. Um, you know, knowing Cade should be bawling by now or something like that. Um, and it was interesting to me that you that you picked her um, to be the handmaiden. I don't think that's given too much away because I think that's pretty no. much. You know, it like, comes out fairly early in the book. Yeah. So um, when, when you started writing this, when you started with Sword of the Guardian, how much of this epic saga did you have kind of planned out? 
So when I started writing Sword of the Guardian, I wasn't even entirely sure it was going to be a series. I mostly just wanted to tell this uh, story about a cross-dressing girl who falls in love with the person she's supposed to be protecting, and then they go through this whole gender identity thing, and I mostly just wanted to play with that and tell that story, and it wasn't until Arinda's character started talking about her past loves that it occurred to me that I could keep this story going. Um, there's room here and in this world for another installment that tells the story of two different women. Um, so yeah, a lot of what ended up happening with Cade, I originally envisioned that we were going to have a bit of a butch femme dynamic and that Cade was going to be my butch, just like Talon was my butch in the first book, and that Arinda was going to be the femme, and the way that it turned out was almost opposite. It was yeah. almost the other way around. Arinda becomes this sassy, sort of badass protector character, and Cade becomes this really unlikely heroine. Um, she And I'm not sure exactly where that came from. I just knew as I started to write her that she was shy and she was quiet and she was more mystified than anybody else as to why the goddess would have picked her for this huge hero job when she's mm -hmm. about the last person on earth that anybody would consider to be a hero. And then I just wanted to tell the story of this person who may appear to the rest of the world to be sort of shy and shrinking and not at all hero material, and how circumstances and having your heart in the right place can sometimes bring out the hero in someone who's very unlikely. So um, I think she ends up doing that. I do think her character may or may not appeal to some people who feel like they want their heroes to be stronger and braver and more assertive out of the box. and um, she's not that way. Uh, but she's but, but, not that but, way. But Arinda kind of takes over that part of the role, you uh -huh. know. She and, does, but don't sell Cade short because Cade was it when it really was critical. She stepped up and mm -hmm. she got done what had to be done. So mm -hmm. you know, and that was that was interesting too. Um, and I really enjoy that um, that aspect of it. That yeah, Arinda was kind of the coach in in a way, but. She stepped up when she had to. She really did. And she was kind of Kate's motivation to be able to find things inside of herself that she didn't know she even had. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of it just being inspired by the way that Arinda has always stood up for what she believed in and never given up and never backed down. And Kate starts to feel like, you know, I, I should be worthy of this woman and I need to step up and take care of her when she needs me. And... I um, I just yeah. want to step in real quick because we haven't really talked about the the relationship between Cade and Arinda, so folks who haven't read the book yet may be, may be a little lost. So for uh, for those of you who haven't read the book yet, uh, Cade and Arinda had a, uh, had a very loving uh, friendship uh, from when they were small kids. They grew up in the castle together, uh, servants, and, and then uh, Cade... Um, Following her fa following tradition, uh, went to was uh, became an initiate, I guess, uh, in the religious order. Um, but not only because it was her familial duty to do that, but she genuinely felt a, a very strong love and connection to the goddess. Um, right before she leaves, you know, they they kind of realize that they're in love with each other. Um, but Cade's Kate is committed to her path, and she goes, um, and then breaks Arinda's heart. Right. So, um, and Arinda, in, if you've read *Sword of the Guardian*, what? You're getting your you're, you're, you're dangerous ground. Danger, Will Robinson. Don't well, get but, away too much but now. Wasn't, but wasn't some of that already discussed in some *Sword of, that's of the Guardian*? Some of that's in *Sword of the Guardian*. Yeah. 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 I'm just worried. I'm nervous. I'm just saying. No. No. I think I'm okay. Do you think I'm all right? Well, it's too late now because I, I, I've already said right. it. All right. Come on. So, all right. So so anyway, so there's this pining, and and in sort of the guardian, uh, Arinda and Talon kind of um, uh, bide their time together, I suppose, for a little bit. Um, so we we get to you know, and and Arinda was always, if I remember correctly, kind of bold, you know, and mm -hmm. didn't really take any shit. She you know she kind of She's put Talon kind of in. Really sassy. And, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, so there. All right, then. So I just wanted to give the, the listeners a little bit of background. I probably should have gone back and reread uh, Sword, but I didn't. Well, I there didn't. you go, loser. You're a, you're a horrible host. I stand by it. Years ago. It, okay. 
All right, so I want to pipe up and say something. I want to be another fawning. I'm going to be a fawning fan again about another part of this book that came as a complete surprise. Now, I don't think I've ever seen it told just this way before, but the the way you described, I don't know, I guess the easiest way to call it the afterlife? Mm. The nexus? The nexus. The spirit nexus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, my hell, that was awesome. I was wanting to do battle in the in the Nexus, damn it! Like we need to battle in the Nexus. That's what we need. That was awesome. That was so creative. So kudos. I really enjoyed that. All those scenes that Thank you had you. in the Thank Nexus. That was, that was cool. That was really cool. Yeah, I think I think if I had to pick if I had to pick one thing, um, I don't know if I can pick one thing. There would have to be two. But okay, I'll pick if. Okay, so my favorite my favorite things about. Mary Shannon's writing, okay? Mm -hmm. World building. Mm -hmm. I love your world building. You know, the, the, the nexus and, and, you know, the lands. and I mean, it, it's really good. I mean, it's really good fantasy world building. Yeah. Um, and I don't think there's, there's, at least from what I've read, um, I, don't, I don't think that there's a whole lot of, um, of other folks that, that are doing it the way that you do. I may be wrong. I don't know. But that genre in that. No, nobody is here to tell me otherwise. So we're just going to go with it. We're going with it. Um, and and the way you write the the, the battle scenes, the the battle mm -hmm. scenes themselves, and um, I just remember in Sword of the Guardian when you know the when the the sisters came out and started blasting people that and was awesome. doing the boom. That, that, you know, that was sitting good. on the couch, uh, just going, yeah! <laughs> you know? <laughs> Those, that is awesome. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. Yes. Okay, so there, now. now yeah, we fawned so we fond all over you now. We did. <laughs> we did. Well, that's okay, I, you keep going, I enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. <laughs> we, we very rarely get complaints over that part. Yeah. So, um, what? Well, I have heard some complaints about that part. People feel like the end of sort of the Guardian might have been a little bit too um, Deus Ex Machina with the the priestess is suddenly getting these powers and being able to start stuff. And um, it was actually one of the biggest conundrums I had to solve when writing Prayer of the Handmaiden because I was like, well, if the priestesses are going into these battles with these super powerful powers what is there to have as a battle? I mean, they're going to win. <laughs> so I had to think through, okay, how are we going to, how are we going to sort of take some of that away and make the bad guys a little more badass so that it's not like the priestess strolls out on the field and waves her staff and everybody dies. Um, and there are still some moments that are similar to that, but it's not as easy as it would have been if she'd marched in there with 200 priestesses with, you know, celestial fire blazing and just knocked everybody out. Um, so there, there were some folks who thought that Sword of the Guardian ended a little bit too easily, but that's only because I was setting it up. For the next <laughs> it was all a plan. Yeah. <laughs> it, well, I was a little surprised when when things didn't work out for Cade quite as um, as well we all expected it to. And she's like, mm -hmm. um, excuse me, it's not <laughs> it's not working, you know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> exactly, you know, and and but you're right. You did make it a lot more challenging. But I like the way I like the way that you did it in that, um, you know, locations. And I'm not going to give I'm not going to give anything away. But locations were kind of key to you know to a lot of this stuff, um, mm. which makes total sense. You know, it, it really did. It made total sense that some things would be better in different areas because of certain mm -hmm. things and. Uh, yeah, it was really good. So, so are you a um, are you a plotter or a pantser? So I try to be a plotter, and I'll usually start writing out an outline of how I think things are going to go, and then they don't go that way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> half the time, I'm in the middle of writing the scene, and I'm like, "What are these characters doing? This is not what I had on my outline for this scene." Um, there's one scene in particular just prior to one of the big battles where Kate and Arinda have this really long, drawn-out, sort of goodbye connecting moment full of angst. I was not planning that at all. It was, we were going to meet at the gates and we are going to charge out and have this battle, and instead there's this moment that happens, 
And I actually really liked the way that it ended up happening. I thought it was really beautiful and it, it um, speaks a lot to sort of their growing understanding of each other, but it was definitely not something that I had planned to put in there. It's how my stories end up being way too high in word count and I have to shave them way down in the editing process. Yeah, you, you, don't, you don't write um, novellas, to be sure. I don't. I've written some short stories for Bold Strokes in some of the anthologies, but short stories are not my forte. I tend to be really long-winded in my stories, and if Bold Strokes would give me a higher word count allowance, I would probably use it all up and then some. So they have to dial me back a little bit. And I think the stories <laughs> end up being stronger for it when they make me edit it down and, and really shave it down to what's most important. I think the stories end up being a lot stronger for it. But, yeah, yeah. otherwise I'd just be... I don't know if I've ever, sort of The Guardian, when I first wrote it, had, I think, 180,000 words in the rough draft. And I had to pare it down to about 120. Wow. And um, I was really grateful for my fabulous editor who helped me do that in a way that um, really retained what I meant to have in the story and cut out some of the wandering around boring parts. I know she didn't cut any battle scenes, damn it. No, we didn't cut any battle scenes. Okay, good. No. <laughs> it made me a little nervous there. Like, what's on the cutting room floor? Oh, my God. <laughs> it, you can mention your editor if you want to. We're, we're big fans of editors, so if you want to mention your editor, if you're under contract and you can't mention your editor, then don't. But, um. <laughs> I don't think they'd have a problem with it. My first editor was Jennifer Fulton. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, who, who's a pretty prolific writer herself, and I probably learned more from her in editing sort of The Guardian than I did in all the years that I spent in college studying English. Hmm. Um, she was she was amazing, and she didn't just edit the work, she actually taught me why this piece didn't work, or why these things over here would be better, or why it was better to rephrase things, and I learned a ton from her. And then I've had Cindy uh, Cressup, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm not even sure how to pronounce her last name correctly, and she edited both Branded and Anne Prayer of the Handmaiden, and um, was just fantastic to work with. and. I think, I think the editors I've worked with, I've been so lucky that Bold Strokes has assigned me people with such um, talent and skill because they've made me a much better writer by the time the book ends up in the hands of the readers. That's awesome. And I do want to say, because I'm, um, I tend to be really sensitive to, um, to errors as I, as I read, um, and again, I, I told Mary earlier that um, that I used a, uh, a text-to-speech program, so um, I can't, I generally can't pick up like you know some grammar type stuff. But you know, usually typos and things like that will just jump out because somebody's reading it to you, you know, and you hear the difference. I don't think I heard anything at all in a big book like that. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. So that's awesome. Congratulations. Thank um, you. <clears throat> So, I forgot what I wanted to ask. I don't know what I want to say. Because, oh, you know, I'm still talking tonight. Go, go, junkie. No, go. I thought we would maybe... Uh, I wanted, I want to say what I'm going to say, but then I want to play the game right after. <laughs> I, know early, I know it's a little early, but maybe we can talk about uh, Brandon Ann after. Mm. What do you think? I'm with that, I love that story. So, yes. <laughs> All right, Sherry, you ready? Yeah. You ready, Mary? I'm ready. I'm trying to say this so I don't, I don't give it away. Um, for those of you lucky bastards that are going to read this book, there is... You're going to pick my person. There's a part of the ceremony toward the <laughs> end that was like, get me a fan. <laughs> That was really interesting. I did not expect that. I read that passage twice. <laughs> I backed that bus up and I read it twice. <laughs> I honestly wasn't sure how that would be received. That was another one of those things that sort of took on a life of its own as I was writing it. That was not what I had intended at all. And it just well, sort of kept going, you and left going and going. And I was like, really? We're going to go this direction with this? Okay. Yes. And um, got to the end of it. And it worked out. I mean, it was really perfect for what I was trying to do with the story, but it was not planned at all. Um, wow. And then I was really worried about how the readers would receive that. I thought some of them might really enjoy it, and some of them might be like, what on earth is this? What? <laughs> what is she doing? Me, it just made me want to go to church. I'm just saying. If I go to church someplace, I don't know. Church should always be that much fun, right? right? Yeah, I tell you. It, you know, anybody reading that probably get religion, no doubt about it. You but know, I, I am an or thing. Mary Shannon can do a damn fine action war battle sequence, 
and she can do something else. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was washing dishes, listening to it, and you know it's time for the for the ceremony. What? What? <laughs> I had to stop everything and just stand there. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> Didn't expect that. You had yeah. your soapy, slippery water, and you're listening to that part. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it it was uh yeah that was really that was really interesting and uh and unique I thought and and it really did um it really did uh help to um I'm trying to say things without giving anything away it really helped to solidify that storyline uh I guess I guess that's the the best way to go with that. I mean, it was, um, and you know, I one of the other things I really liked. And I know you want to play the game right away, but I just want to. I gotta take a moment, anyways. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the other things that that I um, that I really liked was that uh, a bit later on, you know, one of the things that Kate is really uh, concerned about, and it's discussed very early in the book, is um, the. The fact that um, that she had a previous relationship with a woman, and Cade, see, you know, Cade seems to have a lot of internalized homophobia, and and is really concerned with how how her love for Arinda uh, and her physical longing for Arinda is going to affect her um, her standing with the goddess. She's really concerned about this, and I and I I very much enjoyed that the goddess herself got a chance to kind of clear the air a little bit about um, and it, about what what really the rules should be and while I was listening to that I, I got this flash of you know like Jesus sitting up or God you know the Christian God Judeo-Christian God pretty much saying the same thing like I don't know where all this shit came from um, but it weren't me okay <laughs> that, I, I enjoyed that you did that did, was that one of the things that you intended to do, or that was just another one of those things? You know what? God damn it. I'm just... It was an opportunity that I recognized as the story was developing. So I was raised in a very, very conservative religious home, and a lot of the things that I think Kate ends up struggling with in terms of, you know, am I being disloyal? Will the goddess still love me if I do this? Can I love both the goddess and someone else? Um, comes from a lot of the different things that I taught and was surrounded by when I was growing up. And it also comes a little bit from my own um, coming out experience in reconciling who I am and my attraction to women with, um, you know, the things that I had been raised to believe. And uh, it, it occurred to me at a relatively young age, approximately Cade's age actually, that, you know, people put words in the mouth of God um, way too often and they they find ways to make what they feel and what they want and the judgment they would pass on others to somehow claim that that's what God wants and how God feels about things and so as the story was progressing and I realized that Etheria is still a relatively homophobic nation it's kind of very medieval a little bit and it's um, and it's uh, you know cultural norms that um, it was about time to give the goddess the chance to speak for herself and basically say, look, don't put words in my mouth. This is how I actually feel. Just because you guys have taken something and run with it doesn't mean that that's mm -hmm. who I am. And um, yeah, it was a really interesting opportunity that came up in some of the conversations that they had. And um, I felt very good about putting those pieces in. It was another thing I was a little bit worried about because a lot of times readers don't enjoy reading main characters who have internalized homophobia and are struggling with their own sexuality. And um, so it was kind of fun to put in Arinda who was not struggling with it at all. At all. <laughs> she was like, I'm here and I am what I am and it's all good. And, and, um, and it was really Kate who kind of had to reconcile that with what she believed. Um, so it was it was a fun thing to play with. I think you know you, you talk about you know, some readers may not want to read about characters that have internalized homophobia, and that that may be true. But I think the way th in in this in this setting, I think it's very uh, I think it's a, a great way to to present it because you're dealing with uh, with a woman who's deeply religious mm -hmm. dealing with it, and and you know the, there's I think there's a 
there's a, I think that's kind of like a whole other class of internalized homophobia. You know, when you have when you have a deep seated religion um, tied to that. You know, I mean, it's 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 for me, it, it just feels different. Um, I, I, I don't, also very yeah. isolating because these characters are growing up in a world where people don't talk about homophobia or people don't talk about homosexuality and they don't talk about um, even the possibility or the option of loving anyone other than the opposite gender. So in a world like that where you're not seeing anybody else who's like you, when you end up realizing I have these feelings and I am different, you start feeling like I must not be normal, I must not be okay, there must be something wrong with me, I must be sick in some way. And it was important to me to have Arinda sort of um, be able to use Talon and Shasta's relationship to help explain to Cade, you are not the only person who feels like this. I am not a freak for feeling this way, and you are not a freak for feeling this way. And, you know, love is beautiful. And then to be able to have the goddess come and reaffirm that um, was just, it was a really great full circle way to sort of change the world. And what I'm hoping to do with these, with the entire series of books is by the time that I get to the end, I'm hoping that there's going to be a, um, a real sense of the way that these women and their relationships have basically changed the world that they live in. So that's the big picture way down the line if I can write a book faster than once every 10 years. <laughs> that would be awesome because eventually I'm going to be blind. And, <laughs> and I'll be retired by then. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to be retired by then. <laughs> <laughs> so who's Who's uh, who's who's going to be the star of the next book? Because I got to be real honest with you, I was a little disappointed after Sword of the Guardian, and then I, when I found out uh, that it wasn't going to be uh, Shasta and Talon, actually I had thought it was going to be the princess's story, and then you you told me no, no, we're going to go with these. I was like, God damn it, that's not what I want to see. <laughs> So, so who's next? <laughs> okay, so there is a little scene in this book um, towards the beginning where we get to see one of Arinda's underlings, one of her staff, Panna, who is a total bookworm and a complete geek. And there's this cute little scene where she gets caught doing something she's not supposed to be doing and Talon sort of comes to the rescue and saves the day. And um, Panna is actually planned to be one of the main characters in the third book. The third book is actually going to take place in the Outlands. So we're going to leave the palace. We're going to leave a lot of the other stuff. We are going to go way out into the Outlands, and we are going to learn about Outlander culture, um, which oh. is radically different from anything I've written so far in this series, and it's going to be super fun to play with. And so Panna's love interest is going to be one of the Outlanders. One of the Outlanders. So we'll be able to see the... Um, the stuff that kind of got left unresolved in this one, in Prayer of the Handmaiden, picked up again and uh, hopefully resolved a bit in the in the next book. Actually, I actually think it's going to get more complicated. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably going to keep, keep getting more complicated until we get to the very, very last book. And the last book should hopefully wrap everything up and um, explain everything hopefully in a satisfactory way. Um, but no, we've, we've still got a few more installments of making the battle worse before it gets better. All right. So. Mm, stay tuned. I'm very mm -hmm. excited now. Yeah, yeah. Right, quicker, faster. <laughs> okay. okay, so should we play the game? Yeah. Okay. You know you wanted it. It's back. Who would you fuck? <laughs> Are we talking about this Prayer of the Handmaiden or all of the books? No, no, just Prayer of the Handmaiden. Just prayer of handmaiden. <laughs> All right, honestly, this is gonna sound horrible. Probably Mardis. <laughs> oh, wow! Yeah. No, I hadn't considered her. Say it again. Mardis, the uh, uh, she's yeah. my main villain, and she is really badass. And unfortunately, I had to edit out some of the scenes that included her, where we got to get inside of her head and see what's going on. Mm. But um, I'm actually. I'm planning on putting those up on my website as a sort of deleted scenes thing when I get around to editing them up all pretty, so you guys will get the chance to have a little bit of an inside look into her head, but she is just, she's really sexy. She's a complete survivor, and that's really all she cares about is she was raised in this barbarian tribe. She is a barbarian woman. She had to beat all of her brothers and her father to get where she's at. She had to beat, I don't even remember how many other contenders in order to become um, 
what she is to the god in order to become our main bad guy. And so she, um, she's just really badass, and she would be a very sexy experience. And it's a total coincidence that she's a redhead. Is that? All right, Sherry, you're up. Oh, really? I'm picking the goddess Athyris. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I guess I get sloppy seconds this time. I don't think there I don't think there could be sloppy seconds with a goddess. I'm just saying. I don't I think every time would be just fine. <laughs> she wow. could probably take care of multiple people at once too. She's that good. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> good point. <laughs> And she you could have 12 at once at one point, right? So. I think that's, that's right. right. So, hell, yeah. <laughs> that's right. Okay, so I take a Thyrus in the 12. I take all ah. I, I take all 13 of them. All 13 of them. Wow. I'm ambitious. <laughs> I, I have no words. <laughs> no words. Oh, my God. Oh, <sighs> <laughs> got that damn scene again. We got to move on. We got to move I know, on. You know the the okay. So I I just want to say going back to um going back to the relationship between Cade and uh and Athyris. Am I saying that right? Uh, I usually pronounce it Athyris in my head, but that's because I pronounce the world Etheria. Oh. I'm okay with people pronouncing it however sounds best to them. The lady on the computer said a thyrus, so that's what I was That's pretty, too. That's like a thyroid problem. Come on. I'm just going to call her the goddess from now on. The goddess. You know, I really enjoyed the the visual that you... Well, it came across to me as a visual when the goddess is... um, When Cade can feel uh, the direction and stuff that she's supposed to go... Be careful. She's saying, be careful. But she's the handmaiden. I mean, it's in the beginning of the book. Actually, actually, the whole thing was kind. Of, I wasn't going with any. I was just saying, you know, when you know the goddess will tell her to do something, and then she can kind of feel the feel the the shit moving through. <laughs> the power. Shut up! You got me all. You got me all wigged out now. I'm not gonna say anything else. I'm done. I'm just gonna sit here and. Eat my I think sprout. Kay describes it as a current. She yes. It's like a spirit current, like a which is much like better a than the shit. Water or electricity that physically is running through her. Yeah. Um, and it is it is spirit. It's sort of connected to soul. It's the way that um, the the goddess sort of uses her and uses her physical body in order to be manifested in the world. But yeah, she describes it as kind of a a silvery feeling like under her skin and her mm-hmm. veins, and she. <laughs> it took me a long time to figure out how to write those scenes and not use the same words over and over and over again ad nauseum. Mm. Um, it's it's difficult to describe um, sort of, I don't know if you want to call it a paranormal phenomenon or a sensation like that and put it into terms that a reader can understand without them finally rolling their eyes and being like, okay, get over it, we get it. <laughs> it's so. the blue silvery current, I understand. <laughs> blue yes. silver currents of light and, and soul and spirits and whatever, yeah. It <laughs> I think you did a fine job because it didn't stand out to me that yeah. I had no eye rolling over... Uh, <laughs> That's good. That's yeah, good. Over, the, over that, not at all. That was good, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. So it's a winner. Go out and buy a damn book. Yes, go buy the damn book. Go buy the damn book. Or buy two. It. Do we have any questions from our... We our, don't. They're very, they're very quiet tonight. They're so shy. They're very okay. shy. Come on. Maybe it's because Mary's so nice and you, you look so innocent and, and sweet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. See? Looks are deceived. No. I was going to say looks are and everything. <laughs> <laughs> so, real briefly, I know we're running out of time, but um, what I want to just briefly, Branded Ann, that was your debut novel. That was actually my second novel. That one came after Sword of the Guardian. Sort of the Guardian was first? Mm-hmm. Why did I think Brandon? Okay, anyway, let's talk about Brandon Ann for just a minute. I thought Brandon Ann was the first one. Anyway, so, um, what inspired you to write that story? Pirates! <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Pirates, definitely. Okay, so I'm going to be perfectly honest here. I wanted to write Brandon Ann because I was, 
I would walk through like the grocery store and see these bodice ripping romance novels on the shelves that were always a guy and a girl. And I was yeah. like, why can't we have a girl doing bodice ripping of another girl on the cover of one of these? And one of the most quintessential um, trashy romance novel tropes is the whole pirate takes himself a, a innocent girl on board his ship and teaches her the ways of love. And <laughs> So I was kind of like, well, I can do that. I can do that with two girls. And then the characters sort of took on a life of their own and became something much more than the cliched romantic trope, I think. And um, it was a much darker story than Sword of the Guardian, a much more grown-up story. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, I had a lot more fun with it. And I think it, 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 I mean, it still has a delightful trashy romance novel feel to it, which is kind of what I was going for. But I think there's a depth to it that... Um, that maybe some of the more stereotypical stuff doesn't have. So it's been a long time since I read that, but I remember it being. I remember just being so happy with it, you know. Yeah. And I had immersed in that story. Yeah, yeah. then you started yeah. reading it. Branded Ann was, uh, like I said, it's been a long time, but you know, there's some things that that still stick with me. I mean, she just when I think of her, I just feel kind of sad and. Like, oh, she had such a hard time, you know? Yeah, yeah she sticks with you. She's a haunting character. She does. Yeah. She sticks with you. Mm -hmm. Is that well, a she, cat? Well, she has some things in similar, uh, similarly to Mardith, stuff that I really find fascinating, which is this idea of being a survivor and doing what it takes to survive. And in Brandon Ann's case, I think the sadness comes in that she, she loses quite a bit of herself. Um, in her attempts to be so focused on the one thing that she feels like she needs to do with her life. And one of the bittersweet things for me at the end of that book is that she's still so young. She finally, you know, accomplishes what she set out to accomplish, and she's still really young and has to figure out, what do I want to do with the rest of my life now? I've become this person that I never really intended to become and don't really recognize. What do I want to do with the rest of my life? Um, so she was she was a really fun character to write because she starts out as being this person that's not even likable. Um, mm -hmm. She's she's dark and she's sexy, but she's not likable. And I think by the end of the book, I know I was in love with her. I don't know about all the other readers, but um, just getting to know her and her heart and where she really was with things makes her really um, really attractive. Um, Heidi Dyer jumped in with a question I was just about to ask, so thank you very much, Heidi. Uh, any plans for another pirate book? That was a great book. Mm -hmm. You know, I hadn't thought about it. I had so much fun writing it. I think I would only want to write a second one if I could come up with a story that I felt like could equal or surpass the first one. I was so satisfied with the way that it turned out and the way that it ended that I'd want to be able to do it, to do it or a future pirate story justice. I've had some people ask me for... Um, a story featuring Charlie uh, when she grows up and kind of what she does, but the story itself was written on the tail end of the um, the Golden Pirate years. So by mm -hmm. the time that Charlie would be old enough to take over a pirate ship, her life would be one heck of a lot harder as a pirate because it was pretty much almost an obsolete profession <laughs> at that stage. Um, so I might be able to do something a little bit earlier, but I would just have to have a set of characters that I felt like could do... Um, could you justice the way that the first book did? I have a suggestion because um, we always have suggestions. So, okay, because I don't want you to stop doing the series that you're working on because, I mean, let's just be honest, it takes a long time to get another book out, right? So, here's what you got to do. <laughs> you have to you have to work somehow some pirate like characters into this series. <laughs> Right? That I mean, could be a possibility. It's a total possibility. It could totally work. A seafaring person, right? Mm -hmm. and, right? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Put her, put her. <gasps> okay, so <laughs> I don't know. Is there water someplace where the Outlanders are? There's, there's, no, not, not the Outlanders. The Outlanders actually live in a um, sort of a plains base of the mountains type area. <laughs> Colorado, where I live. <laughs> um, yeah. But there is an Ethereum province, Marinland, that is actually an island off the coast of the mainland. So there, there are some go. possibilities there. We're problem solvers. Yeah, I say run with that, just saying. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you could work in like some saloon girls or something, that would be awesome too. You know, we just... We gotta love the saloon girls. <laughs> And the Madam Jean Sherry. 
posters in the outlet, so that'll be fun. <laughs> Just saying, we'd love to have you back, and if you use one of our ideas, you're guaranteed a spot. Oh, well. Absolutely. You <laughs> might even get a gift. <laughs> Okay. So, anybody else have any comments out there in Watcher Land? I do not believe so. I'm looking around. Hold on one second. No, not there. I try and check everywhere just in case folks yeah. can't get to there. No, I think we're good. I think we are good. You want to talk about what we got coming up after we after we thank Mary and all that kind of good stuff? Well, maybe we have, well, I think, well, hmm, I think there may be enough people on the next show that we have surpassed any amount of people we've had on one show at one time. And hopefully shit won't explode. Right. We're hoping shit won't explode. Absolutely. Um, but let me just whisper two names in your ear so you can, you know, start, start percolating on this one. Ready? Jesse Chandler. Mm -hmm. And Lori Lake. And at least two others. At least two others. We wow. already know who they are, but I'm not at liberty to say at the moment. You're not? We can't nope. say? Nope. It's a secret? Oh, I did not know. Okay. So, Lori, uh, yeah, Lori and Jesse are coming, to, uh, coming by with a couple of friends. We're going to do another live video show uh, wow. so that they can uh, share some some information about the new, what's it called, Lesbians on the Loose? Is I think that's what it's called. It's an anthology, like mystery anthology. people and whatnot. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I got an O on my right. elbow. What? Yeah, I, I don't remember the exact title. But yes. <laughs> it might be, it's either Lesbians on the Loose or Loose Lesbians. I can't remember which one it is. Hey, it's a winner. <laughs> <laughs> so that one is scheduled for July the... Saturday in July after the 4th of July. I don't know. That would be correct. Yes. Why do I never pull this up? I got notes for days for talking to Mary Shane. Do you think I remember to pull up Modern Damn Show? No. It doesn't matter. We'll let you know before it happens. But um, Mary's doing a giveaway. So, yeah, Andy, you got to look it up anyway. Sorry. <laughs> so Mary's giving away, uh, and nice. like, like we talked about earlier. What? See, I'm so tired of looking it up now. All right, then. So uh, Mary's given away, like we said earlier, a paperback, which she will mm -hmm. sign and send to you herself. So there will also be Mary Shannon uh, fingerprints and possibly some DNA particles. So <laughs> <laughs> DNA particles. Hey, slip a hair in there, would you? There you go. <laughs> some, some dead skin. It's all oh, good. Those right. things could be collectible at some point. You don't know. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, I have some extra buttons, too, so I'll throw in some Prayer of the Handmaiden little button badges also. Better yeah, than my fingerprints and locks of my hair, I would think. Yeah, but that'll still be there, too, so it's like bonus bonus. There you go, extra bonuses. <laughs> okay, so uh, so one lucky winner will get the um, the DNA sample, and another lucky winner will get an ebook, which will be just as enjoyable but with less bonus. That's true. Yeah, we'll have less bonus. Yeah. So, um, do we want to? Do we? Ha do you have a question you'd like people to ask, or or something, a topic you'd like them to comment on? Mm. Or they could just tell you how great you are. I mean, that's always an option. We like to go <laughs> to that option. Gives compliments. <laughs> yes. Whoever goes here, yeah. <laughs> the best compliment. <laughs> You know, one of my favorite things um, when people send me, uh, you know, reviews or commentary on what they enjoyed about the story is when they tell me the, the connections or the meanings that they found in um, characters or the way that a particular scene worked out that really meant something to them. So I would love to hear if there's any particular scenes in these books that really meant something to you and why. Okay, and can can that be for any of your three books? Any of the books. Okay. Uh, sorry, if I don't write things down while while we're talking about it, I won't remember any scenes. Can I put any scenes or characters that that you connected? Scenes, characters, 
um, lines from the book. Sometimes I'll have people who will write to me and be like, this one thing that the character said meant a lot to me. So, yeah, I just like to hear anything about people's sort of personal reactions to what's in there. Okay, awesome. And then, um, so, Andy, do you have that date yet? July 11th. July 11th. Okay, so all of you lucky uh, listeners and watchers, you have until July 10th. You have through July 10th to leave a comment on our website, cocktailhour.us, under this particular show, episode 101, uh, and let us know if there are, what, what scenes or characters uh, moved you, connected that you connected with, and why. You know what I'm saying. So just leave those things. Uh, leave a nice comment, and um, and then we will pick a winner. We will pick two winners uh, on on the July 11th show. And we'll let you know. So, all right. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Mary, for being here, and we hope you will come back and have that you had a good time. Oh, this was totally fun. You guys are awesome. Thanks. We think you're awesome too. And Sherry, as always, you are wonderful. Thank you. It's you know it's tiring. It's hard. It's got to be tough. Yeah, yeah. It, it's hard being so awesome all the time. But I mean, who am I to tell you that? I mean, I you know. already know. I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mary, so much for coming on. We've been Thanks, big fans uh, for for a really long time, and we're very happy that you were here. And um, all right, well, I'm going to hit the button now because that's my job, and I always forget. Let's say goodbye, everybody. Goodbye, everybody.